Hey, it's Scott, and welcome back to another episode of Spin Magazine's Lip Service. I'm with the amazing Cassandra Jenkins. Thank you for coming. Thanks for having me. Of course. You're from New York. I'm from New York, so another commonality here. What yeah. part of New York are you from? I'm from Manhattan on the Upper West Side. Awesome. I'm from Long Island, the mean streets. I think I've heard oh, yeah. you reference Long Island in something. Here I and have, there. Yeah. yeah. You've got kind of, I, I can hear a little bit of the accent coming through. Yeah. What are the references to Long Island that I remember when I was researching you that I heard? Um... It would be One wild of the songs, if you maybe. knew this person, but okay. <laughs> it would be a very, very small world. But my friend Warren, um, that I know from working at the farmer's market, I worked at the farmer's market on the Upper West Side for three years, and sometimes in Union Square and sometimes other markets as well, but there's a, a fisherman that comes every Sunday, and his name's Warren, and he has a lot of just... He is full of one-liners, just <laughs> constant one-liners. Also, just like, just real wisdom. Uh, and he's got a thick Long Island accent. He loves his mom. And, and that he, sounds like it could be me. Yeah. <laughs> 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 and um, yeah, so he he uh, I I reference him in the song New Bikini. Oh right, okay. Record. That's where I remember exactly. He, so. He's talking to me about water and yeah. his mom. Well, let's see if I can come up with as many one-liners as him, but I'm not <laughs> sure if I will. But I want to talk to you about, I want to take it back, Cassandra, and talk about your upbringing and the new record, which is phenomenal. And the new record, which ended up on our list of the best records of the year, and Spin Magazine entered, Daniel Cohen and I did a podcast, and we spoke about your record as being one of the top 10 records of the year. So take me back to the beginning, if you don't mind. You grew up in a very musical family, yeah. and, and I love the whole story behind it. Your parents actually performed on cruise ships i believe they did so yeah. tell me all about it yeah um i mean we could we could do a whole podcast series about my parents and <laughs> yeah. their their whole musical life um that's round two yeah, yeah when you get my parents talking and telling stories i mean it's wild some of the stuff that comes out they've they've had a lot of experiences they were also touring musicians um and sometimes cruise ships they played uh sort of the like hotel circuit and uh, they were in basically a lounge act. I don't know if you've ever seen The Fabulous Baker Boys. Sure. But that was a movie that I watched many times as a kid. I think my parents sort of uh, related to that that band in yeah. that movie. Um, and so, yeah, they kind of stopped touring when I was born and settled in New York City where they had a regular gig playing in the house band at a restaurant in Little Italy called SBQR. Oh, cute. I've and never, again, I've never so been know, there, but I've been to a lot of places. Before. It's it's. Uh, I'm starting to get like into the the details here, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I gotta try to remember to zoom out. But they uh, they raised uh, me and my siblings in uh, on the Upper West Side, and we we toured as a family band on the East Coast of. Uh, most summers growing up and when i say toured it was it was uh yeah, what kind of tours were these you know it was pseudo family vacation and uh, sort of chaotic stuffing everything into a car and getting on the road and going and playing shows was it like we're going to disneyland but we're also going to play the local whatever <laughs> it may be at disneyland or was that that would be cool we <laughs> we always went north instead okay. of south but um <laughs> We would play these little folk festivals, uh, pretty obscure folk festivals up the coastline. Um, my brother plays the violin. My sister plays the guitar and the banjo. And I kind of play like, you know, I, I was playing kind of whatever the other ones weren't playing, I think. And that's how I picked up a few different instruments. And my dad's a piano player. My mom is a bassist. So that was enough to get the show on the road once we were all old enough to actually travel. And I love the fact that you were touring before you were like 12 or something, right? Yeah, and I didn't really know I was touring. I didn't really think about it. Yeah. You know, I, I actually did, I just didn't think twice about being in a family band and playing shows and and having that kind of take the place of a summer vacation was these these road trips with my family. And now that I'm, I've taken a little break from touring because of COVID. I'm touring again. I can kind of see, like, oh yeah, this is what I've been doing my whole life. Like, no wonder it feels kind of like home yeah. to be doing that. By the way, what was it like growing up in that household? Because you had concerts in that household, mm -hmm. and I imagine to be like some kind of Wes Anderson film or something, yeah. where everyone's playing an instrument and there's sounds coming from every floor. I, was yeah. it like that in a way? 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's funny. A lot of people say when they see us, they're like, oh, like, you know, you've got a little bit of Royal Tannenbaum's going on here. <laughs> and uh, I just watched that movie with my brother and it was kind of funny watching him see it for the first time and be like, OK, I can kind of see why people say that. <laughs> I don't know if it's a good or a bad thing. <laughs> Um, it's a good thing because stylistically incredible. I just saw the last, yeah. was it The Last Depot? The, what's the movie, the, the new movie you just put out? I haven't seen uh, it yet. It's great. And, and stylistically, he's incredible. Yeah, I um, love his films. Um, another fun fact, when I moved into an apartment in New York, I checked the mail and he had lived in my apartment no way. before I lived there. So just a weird thing. You know, I always look for connections, wow. as we mentioned. So Wes Anderson, wherever you are, we lived in the same place. Anyway, and go, we, love go, you. we love you. Go um, ahead. <laughs> so. But yeah, I I often describe it as sort of like it felt a little bit like a cross between um, a conservatory dorm room and uh, and and kind of like a a bohemian. Just I don't, there there was music coming out of every room um, and. Basically, we live in half the house, and we rented out half the house, and we were often renting to other musicians. So at one point, there was an opera singer, a baritone, who was there singing in the Met. We had um, Laurel Massé, who was in the Manhattan Transfer. Wow. Uh, and and then we had a, a violinist and uh, a bassist. It was just like many, many musicians. Um, Basically, there was nothing you were going to be other than a musician growing yeah. up in a household of yeah. like 15 musicians around you at all times, if, I guess. If right? I'd been any other thing, like it would really, I'd be a serious black sheep. <laughs> yeah. um, and but who were you listening to when you were growing up? Because obviously you had all these musical elements around you and you were exposed to so much music, but who were your role models? Were they singer-songwriters? Was it mm -hmm. folk musicians? Mm -hmm. And obviously I, I go to people like Dylan and yeah. Patti Smith and Bowie and Obviously, more modern people like Amy Mann, yeah. Alanis Morissette. But who were yeah. the people that you really took to? Um, well, one of the first records that my dad ever gave me was Joni Mitchell's Blue. And so I, I really looked up to her a lot and still do. I mean, I go back and watch some of her concert videos now, and it just blows my mind to see how consistently incredible she was at, at all points, Definitely. really. And um, especially as a young person. Uh, that's really sometimes what blows me away the most to see her her vision as such a young person. Um, so I really adored her. I mean, I, I'm going to see a friend at some point while I'm here who will remember me like showing up at my freshman dorm room playing Joni Mitchell songs <laughs> for everyone. Like that's what I knew. Um, and then I really looked up to the folk musicians around me, the songwriters uh, that were just writing writing folk songs. Um, and uh, those were the, the people that were usually performing at our house. We About 20 years ago, that's when we started doing house concerts. So I really, What were those like, by the way, those house concerts? Uh, are they still happening? Or? They're not right now, but okay. we, our last one was, I think, March 8th, 2020. Wow. I mean, it was right up until the last minute. So, And we thought about doing them again, but we're, we're waiting until we really get the green light. Um, were there ever any very big artists besides obviously yourself performing? Um, let's see, like Bela Fleck came and played a solo mm -hmm. show. Amazing. And seeing him in that setting was really fun. And just, you know, I, I've always appreciated him as an instrumentalist. Yeah. And But to see him just there telling stories in this really intimate setting and to hear the banjo played acoustically in that room, I was really blown away and um, had a whole new appreciation for his 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 work um and and also like edgar meyer um similarly played around that same time um it was like the precursor to tiny desk concert it was your yeah. family's version of that right yeah. before it happened it's incredible but, but you actually went to school for design mm -hmm. in 2006 so yeah. at what point did you decide to make the pivot and did you always know that because you had a lot of odd jobs along the way i know that you yeah. were like a photographer and you worked at a museum and yep. all these different things you worked yeah. at the farmer's market as you said yeah but when so many odd jobs so many odd jobs when was music and i and i'm assuming all these things shaped who you are as a musician so how did that all come into play for you um i mean that's a great question you really did your research always, always um yeah. i i've been doing music all along and it was you know I, I really have been doing it all along, but I 
so I didn't really think twice about am I ever I, I just have always assumed I will always be playing music my whole life but I really didn't think of it as a job or as a, the thing that I did. I didn't really have the guts to call it the thing that I did. Mm. I, I didn't, or not, I didn't, it's not that I didn't have the guts, but I didn't, um, I didn't think of myself as a musician. It was just this thing that I did with yeah. my family and always did growing up. And it was sort of second nature. I didn't think of it as my profession or anything. I think the first time, I wrote musician on my my visa paperwork was in 2010. Um, then it was official. And it, well, it wasn't even at that point. <laughs> even, I mean, even at this point, I'm like, is it real? Is it real, right? Um, but I remember writing musician on my visa application and being, I felt like I was getting away with something. I was yeah. like, I'm putting, the, I, I wonder if anyone <laughs> else can see this. But I was going on tour. I was playing banjo in this band called Uncle Earl, and they had a tour in Australia, and they asked me to come out the last minute, and I had never gone on tour before. So that was my first tour, was in 2010, playing the banjo it's in fun, Australia. It's funny, because my parents only quantify that as when I, did I make money playing music. Right. So until I made money, there, my dad was always like, when are you going to get a job, kid? And I'm like, I have a job. I play drums. He's yeah. like, do you make money at it? I'm like, I, a little bit. Well, yeah. then it's not a job, you know? Um, but yeah, so I, I don't know. Did, you, did your parents mm -hmm. look at that? Are, are they supportive of your musical career? I mean, Yeah, I mean, it's funny. So my dad's a piano player. He's still, uh, every weekend, he's he's out playing piano at restaurants and hotels and um he calls it music by the pound is kind of his uh right. his self <laughs> self-deprecating way of referring to what he does um and i think i got a lot of support from them because they get it that's what they've been doing their whole lives but there's also the twist on that which is they get it so much that they don't want me to make the same mistakes that they did so there was a lot of um I, I feel like they were always trying to dissuade me from making it my living because mm. they know how incredible it is to love what love music sure. and to not complicate it with um, having that be the thing that you depend on for making a living. Um, and, you know, I understand that more and more as I get older and things do get more complicated and um, in, in all aspects of life. But uh, I think feels inevitable that I was going to do something where my life and my work were going to be the same thing. That just feels natural to yeah. me. It just feels like a, I don't really know what else I would do. I did, you know, and like you said, I, I worked a lot of jobs, but I was always playing in bands. Like when I was working in magazines and I was in my early 20s. What would you do at magazines, by the way? Uh, I worked at The New Yorker. Oh, great. And I was the assistant to the visuals editor. So... Um, Hence what you went to school for, I think, right? Yeah, I studied, yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. Um, photography and design, yeah. and uh, I threw myself in there. I got my kind of a dream job, like right out of college, and but I was going to my desk job, and then it, as soon as I was out of work, I was going and playing in honky-tonk bands, mm. like in dive bars in the East Village, and, <laughs> and staying up late, and then getting two hours of sleep and going to work work the next day and that's something you can do when you're 20 years of old course. and um and I did that and I think part of the reason that I got that job was my boss at the time Elizabeth uh I think she liked that I was I had a lot going on in my life and that my life wasn't just my job because I think she did meet a lot of people in that industry who like that's all they think about. That's all they do. And I, I think ultimately that's why I didn't stay. <laughs> yeah. Because um, I realized, oh, I don't want to be uh, fully on this side of things. I also want to be out there making stuff. And and uh, I got a lot of support from people when I went on to do that. I think it was pretty clear that that's where my heart was. But, man, it was cool working there. I loved everybody that I met. And it was a wild experience. So this like, is what you're about. What's that? What what year was this? About 2010 uh, or 12 or something like it that? It was, I left the magazine in 2008. Okay. So it's kind of ancient history at this point, but um, but it was my first real job. So that was when I was really like a dedicated like nine to fiver um, and beyond. It was more like eight to eight kind of. And, <laughs> uh, and those fashion jobs, you're working 24 seven. You're always on call. and Yeah. 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 And since then like all of my jobs have always been kind of part-time mm. 
uh, and have I've been playing in bands all along. And so, yeah, just only actually up until the week that my record was released, I had a huge deadline uh, oh, wow. for my job at the museum. Oh, that's right. You worked at the museum, too. Yeah, I was working at the Museum of Natural History yeah. on the archive of their Gems and Minerals collection, which is also just like a sweet <laughs> job. Feels yeah. also kind of Wes anderson yeah. in ways. Um, By the way, even the title of the record, An Overview of Phenomenal Nature, is connected to the security guard, I believe, that you met at the museum, at the Met, right? Yeah, it was at, it was at the Met Breuer. Um, mm. But yeah, I, in any case, like, Basically, this is the first year where I, I haven't done another job in a while. So Amazing. So walk me through this. So you're playing in bands. Yeah. You're playing in bluegrass band. At a certain point, you meet Craig Finn. Yep. And uh, and walk me through up until the point of this is now your second record on every top 10 list. Everyone named this one of the best records of the year. So I want to get from that point to how we got to this, which yeah. obviously, like you said, you just ha got you know rid of your job. So like, yeah. it's incredible to, to be at this point where did you think you'd end up on so many lists like this? It's incredible. No, I mean, even hearing you say that, I'm like, who are you talking well, to? Well, and, and it's funny, Sandra, because I posted something on Instagram the other day and it was like, it's NPR, it's Stereo Gum, yeah. it's Spin, of course, yeah. which is one of the reasons why we wanted you here. And it, there's so many great indie publications and Elle Magazine, Interview and everything that name this, you know, some of the songs and obviously the record is one of the best records of the year. So walk Smile. me from your first record to this record and and, uh, and again, the process of how we ended up here. Yeah, um, you know, I've been... I feel like uh, sometimes I think about myself as like a little dust bunny that just keeps rolling, collecting dust as I go, <laughs> and um, and now I'm this this like uh, sizable dust bunny. I've yeah. I've like played in a lot of bands and um, sung on a lot of records and stuff, and eventually just found my community that I really love and 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 feel like I found my home in a lot of ways, which has enabled me to just keep keep doing this. Mm. Uh, and I met. Well, let's see. I just I was playing in tons of bands. Um, and there's not a real robust scene in New York for singer songwriters. I mean, there's the Mercury Lounge, yeah. there's the Bowery Ballroom, but truth is, like, so many musicians live in Los Angeles. So, yeah. was there ever like a, a conscious decision, like, to stay in New York, being an artist, or at some point did you think, you know, I need to move out to L.A., yeah. maybe Nashville, the songwriters there? New York is not like the hotbed of like singer songwriters unless I'm incorrect. Right? Yeah, I mean, I never thought twice about it. I I always wanted to be in New York. I love New York. It's really my home. You'd be surprised. I mean, I was just talking to a friend today. I met a lot of really great songwriters at little house shows and stuff like that. Okay. I went to a house show probably around in around 2008 something like that where I met I met my friend Luke Temple. Um who lives out here now um my friend gabe gahane like a, a bunch of people ariel east uh, like everyone was singing that night one or two songs and we were all so much younger now and we're still all kind of out here doing the same thing and uh i think that that's true for a lot of people in new york it, it surprisingly stays more the same than we give it credit for yeah. you know it yeah. does change a lot but um I'm always impressed by how much people stick around and and um and it does it does harbor really good music um but it it kind of shifts in neighborhoods where it goes uh like a lot of venues have closed and yeah. when a venue closes you kind of have to figure out like okay where are we going to go next and another little thing emerges and for a while I was playing a lot at this place called the Manhattan Inn which was a a place in the round it had a white piano in the middle of it and I was there every night of the week. Huh. And I feel like I, I made a lot of really important friendships there. And, you know, that was when, that was years ago. And it was anyone from, like, Greg Saunier from Deerhoof would play solo drum sets at midnight, you know, on a random Tuesday. And then uh, I played a show once with Big Thief there. Mm. Um, and Katie Von Schleicher, who's another friend of mine, was playing there a bunch. And... My friend David Moore. I mean, I'm just trying to think. Lots of people. So there is a there is a community happening in New York that yeah. I actually wasn't even aware of. It but. just. I mean, that was my little community. Yeah. That's where I felt I found my home, and I think there's little communities everywhere yeah, yeah. that I'm not aware of. And and um. But the truth is, a lot of your songs are about those daily 
encounters and those life experiences yeah. that can only sometimes happen in a place like New York yeah. because you're interacting with people on the subway. Yeah. Maybe you're taking a walk in Central Park. I'm from New York, so I know exactly what you're talking yeah. about. And by the way, it's funny because you come out here. It doesn't really happen out here because everyone's right. so isolated. Yeah. Nobody walks. Yeah. I don't know. I heard sometimes totally. you, you love to go for walks. I do. I'm where, where would you walk in LA? You can't really I know, walk I'm, anywhere. I'm, <laughs> people are always laughing at me because I'm often walking to meetings when I'm here and and uh, they're not always beautiful walks. Yeah. Like sometimes they're they're in places where you don't really want to be walking. It doesn't look like so much traffic, but um, but yeah, walking is such a part of New York. And and your storytelling too. Yeah, yeah, mm. absolutely. Like that kind of wayfinding. I'm really interested in how walking around any city will really shape your experience. It'll change like what little sound bites you hear. What what um whatever you end up seeing that day and all the connections that you make between those things like that. I really, I really get off on that. Um, but yeah. And I forget what I was going to say, something in response to what you were talking about a second ago, but, um, just walking around in New York yeah. and LA, but, but oh, then and I just, I think just people in New York will really riff with you, yeah, you know? Course. And like, there's a clip to, the way that we interact with each other in New York that I really love. And it is a little bit harder to do that here. Sometimes I feel like if I want to riff with someone, like I might catch them off guard here because it is a little bit more isolated and especially nowadays. Um, Definitely. Well, I was going to say there's a slew of characters on this new record yeah. that uh, probably were inspired by fictitious or real life people, I assume, that you met in your travels and also in New York. So yeah. let's talk about it for a moment. The new record has been out about a year now. Yeah. Does it feel like it's been a year? Uh, that's a, it feels like it's been 20 years. Honestly. <laughs> right. This year has been many, many years in one. Um, and we've all aged a, a bunch. Um, and some of the characters actually on the record are, I met out here in Topanga Canyon. So, so California does make its, its way into the stories. Um, and yeah, it's been a, a, my life really changed this year in ways I never could have expected. Uh, I put out a record thinking nobody would really hear it. Um, mm. I remember sending it to my friend, my friend Jarvis, who uh, I played in a band with short uh, for a brief period, and and who plays in the band Woods. Um, when I finished my record, we got together, and he was like, "What's what's it like? What's it sound like? Send it to me." And I was like, "It's it's a weird." it's kind of a weird record. Like I kind of name check a lot of our friends and <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I'll send, I'm a little embarrassed, but I'll send it to you. Just let me know if it's okay. Let me know if you think I can put this out. It was like, I was just, that's how I felt about it. And I sent it to a few of my friends just being like, is this all right? Like you sent it to Haley, I imagine. I didn't send it to her <laughs> until it came out. <laughs> okay. I was too scared. <laughs> There's actually, a song called Haley on the record, which is what we're referencing. So. Yeah. So yeah. it's, it's kind of a love song. It's yeah. just, it's like basically saying like, you know, long, long live Haley Gates is, yeah. is one of the lyrics. And um, I was too embarrassed to send it to Haley. Like very similarly, I was like, is she going to hate this? Is this going to embarrass her? Um, but actually, she and I are going to shoot a music video for this song tomorrow. Amazing. amazing That's amazing. why I'm here in Los Angeles. Oh, amazing. Because Haley, um, Haley's directing a video for her song. Incredible. It all comes full circle. Yeah. yeah. So take me back 2019. Obviously, you were supposed to go on tour with the, the rock musician David Berman. And unfortunately, you know, a tragic happened, tragedy happened. Uh, and, you know, you end up getting on a plane uh, to go to Norway. Yeah. Uh, like, I don't know if it was that same week or whenever it was timing wise, but uh, talk me through that process and what happened. And, and obviously, I know Norway had, had was a big inspiration and your travels as writing this record. Right. And so talk to me about that time period and and how this all came to be. Yeah. Um, uh, that whole time period. I looked back at my calendar uh, and some of my journals from that period, and it's amazing how much was happening in just such a short time span. Mm. And the fact that that what emerged out of that as a record just doesn't really surprise me because it was so dense. Um, every day was a, another wild one at wild experience after another. Um, whereas you know now we're living in this time where I think bl days are sort of blending together in a lot of ways. Um, and I think that happens sometimes when you travel or when life changes are happening really quickly. There's just uh, a lot of life can happen in a very short period. And so uh, actually my friend Jarvis that I was mentioning uh, and my friend Katie invited me to play in the Purple Mountains touring band. Um, 
not too long before it was about to start, uh, basically, uh, they realized that it would be helpful to have an acoustic guitarist sort of shadowing David because he doesn't, he didn't always want to play guitar while he was singing and mm. that would sort of change maybe from night to night they anticipated and by the time we got to the studio he really wasn't playing guitar at all so i i suddenly realized like oh i'm actually i'm i'm sort of playing all of david's parts were you playing lead guitar or were you playing like no i was playing rhythm? acoustic so oh, i was, was kind of okay. like his like shadow, the way yeah. that yeah i i thought of myself as as his acoustic guitar shadow mm. and like the way that i accompany myself on on the guitar is sort of what i was doing with him and um and that way if he felt like playing he couldn't and if he didn't he wouldn't but he ended up really not playing during those rehearsals um and my friend cyrus was playing lead guitar uh you done like four rehearsals four, I think, yeah that. four rehearsals that was that was that was it um and i was on my way to the next rehearsal the day before our first show when i got the news that he had taken his life and um I, you know, obviously was very shocked and we all were. And I spent those few days after processing. that processing that with the band, like together in this very strange period of not fully realizing what was, what had really happened. Mm. Um, I think we were all just so geared and, and oriented towards this one reality, which was going on tour with our, one of our heroes and, and then this other reality became what we were all having to grapple with. And we were, I just felt us kind of like, I felt myself toggling back and forth between uh, accepting that reality and not. Um, and as it happened, I, when I was invited to play in this band, I basically canceled all my plans in order to play in the band. Cause of I course. just thought this is a once in a lifetime experience. And, and I, I dropped everything. So I, I had, plans to go to a wedding i had plans to record a record with josh kaufman which we'll, which we'll get to yeah, yeah and then i had a ticket to norway which i forgot to cancel and so the day that our tour was supposed to start was also the day that i had originally planned to go to norway mm. and uh it just so happened that it was like at the time when our, we would have taken the stage was the time that i was taking off in this plane as it turned out i was on the flight that i was supposed to be on originally wow so but everything had changed um and so i thought okay i have this flight i'm gonna lose the money anyway if i if if i go or not like i, I bought this ticket and um i tore myself from this kind of morning experience that i was having with this band and just got on this i took 30 minutes to pack, got on the flight, and stayed with my friends off the coast of Norway on an island. Um, For a wedding, I believe, right? Or, the yeah. wedding, yeah, I was on my way to the wedding. Uh -huh. I stayed with some other friends on this little island where I've gone a few times in my life and uh, and kind of spent that time mourning and writing and being with these people who just welcomed me in uh, at the end of the tourist season in this really beautiful, beautiful place. Um where I would stay up late at night by candlelight um, writing because my body was still in New York time and I was in Norway and it was just so many kind of like layers of where am I and what am I actually doing? Yeah. Um, and of course, as I, as each day went on, I would be like, Oh, I would be in Pittsburgh today. I was supposed to be in Texas today. And then I would get a message from someone like, Hey, are you like, what time's the show tonight? And I had to be like, there, there's no show tonight. Like where, where? Yeah, did you not see yeah, it happen? And, yeah, but that, you know, that kind of thing was happening all the time. Um, and getting messages from people kind of give, I, I got a lot of stories from people about like, hey, here's this letter that David wrote me. And um, I thought you might like reading it. And, and uh, but there I was out like in Norway kind of doing this on this grand adventure. Um, and had you started to collect notes about like, like let's say poems or mm -hmm. just voice notes because you had, you know, you were, whether it would, you know, everybody mourns and grieves in different ways, but yeah. was yours sort of cathartic in the way that you wanted to just document what you were going through to hopefully, you know, make another record? I wasn't even thinking about a record, honestly. I was just sort of uh, like, okay, I don't, um, the next three months of my life had this plan and now I 
have nothing planned and what am I going to do with that time and um I, I was kind of in love with someone at the time so I was sort of like went and visited them and um I uh I just started to just travel and and write uh I I got asked to play some shows so I did that I had some funny experiences doing that and and yeah, I mean, the mourning process for me was strange because I, I was mourning someone I didn't really know mm. that well. I, I, and um, but I was getting I, I continue to get to know through it, through their work and through stories about them. Uh, as I go on, I meet a lot of people that played with him or knew him and um, and experienced some some version of his life at some point. Um, and uh so yeah, I I was not thinking about a record. I was just on a, this kind of, you know, I think when when something tragic happens or when you're in a crisis, sometimes it turns on a lot of things in, in my brain anyway. And and I I I was in an almost I wouldn't call it manic state, but I was like so alert. I was mm. so awake to everything because I had just had a lot of parts of me just get kind of shattered or or just shook up. Um, and so I was just so my eyes were so wide open and I was just recording everything obsessively because that's just one of my, that's just something that I've always done. Mm. Um, I was re recording a lot of audio of people's voices, um, storytelling, people telling me stories. And I think too, when you're walking around the world with that sort of eyes wide open energy, I think sometimes it calls a lot of people into that. Of um, and you meet characters. And I, th I think in general, I have, a way about me. I, I just noticed people talk to me. <laughs> um, and uh, you're like the so, world's therapist in a way. <laughs> sometimes that's good. Sometimes that, but that's bad. Yeah, I don't. I don't know how qualified I am to be the world's <laughs> therapist, but. But interesting sometimes. enough, though, you come back from this trip and you sell almost all of your equipment. I heard. Right? Yes, I did. I, I got back from the trip. I was very discouraged. I was really. I mean, I still think about it right now, and I get pretty sad. I, I, was crushed. I. I I really also, you know, aside from this person and who they were, like, I also looked up to uh, to David for being like a musician that was doing everything in spite of how hard it it can be, and and um and someone who was so like genuine to me, um, to lose that figure, regardless of whether or not I knew them, um, was pretty crushing, and I think it was for a lot of people, um. And then I just felt like, okay, I, I just played in the best band I'm ever going to play in. Like, what? How do I ever top that? Like, I I might as well sell my equipment. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and I too, I just I was just so dis I was just so discouraged. I was and I was depressed. I was really depressed. <laughs> I was um, taking care of someone who was pretty sick at the time, and I just I I didn't know what to do. Mm. I I I didn't think I had a record in me but I did have a tour with Craig Finn that I had booked ages before and where'd you meet Craig by the way Craig who sings for the hold steady I met Craig through Josh Kaufman who produced this record that we're talking about and Josh has produced many many records and he often uh over the years has asked me to come sing backup vocals which I love doing I love being in the studio I love um being an instrument for someone else's thing and and throwing myself into other people's worlds musical worlds i learn a lot from that too and and i love working with josh so josh now, were you Paul, a fan of the hold steady by the way yeah but you know i actually knew craig's music more than i knew the hold steady i think i didn't grow up kind of loving the hold steady like some of my friends did um but i i i always knew like that they were a great band great lyrics like a lot of my friends who were um kind of bookish like loved the hold study yeah. just for their lyrics alone you know well, the truth is there's like a spoken word poetic mm -hmm. element to craig and, and i had mentioned yeah. to you that i even played in a band with tad who plays yeah. in the hold study so another connection we have but but yeah so it, it's funny because there there are definite similarities yeah. between their music and what craig does and what you are doing now absolutely sure. i mean i whenever i join a band i always think of it as i'm I'm going to school in this person's way of thinking. Mm. And anytime I, I do that, I, I just prepare myself for that. And I come out of it with like my own little like degree of that person's brain, you know, um, for that short chapter. So I think when I 
got to essentially join Craig's band. We did some live shows together and then I did this tour with Craig. You know, I'm I'm there every night. I'm watching him talk to the audience. I'm walking him watching him talk to people after shows. I'm watching how he talks to his band. I'm seeing how he incorporates the stories into the songs every night, how it changes from night to night, you know, what he puts on his rider and and the jokes he tells. What does he put on the rider, by the way? <laughs> there's are there are specific things in there that we should know about. Six cans of Budweiser. That's it. That's Nothing it. else. No. Just six cans of Budweiser. <laughs> That's it. It's, I always love these stories because sometimes, yeah. like back in the day, you'd hear these artists like, "I just want the green M and M's on the." It's like, really? Do you are you really going to make someone sift through the M and M's just yeah. to give you the green ones? Because as far as I know, they all taste the same. But I guess people have their things. But that doesn't seem. I think knowing the, the band, it seems normal. So. I think that the the Budweiser like flies in the face of all of that. Yeah. And um, I came in, and I here I am like a, I I I totally mess that up uh with i was like i'll have you know i'm i'm a healthy eater take care of my body i needed a couple little things to keep me going on the road you know just some carrots some hummus some like stuffed grape leaves some fa- a couple fancy things here and there so i, I kind of messed up that that whole vibe when i was on tour with them but you know i have my needs so so you guys meet and uh and obviously this has something to do with shaping what is now to become this new record right yeah so that's all to say like I I actually got together with Craig right before I went into the studio with Josh. Um, all I had with me was a a, a, a an ongoing crisis. Yeah. Um, very little equipment. A tour coming up with Craig, and dates with Josh on the books, and a whole bunch of notebooks and text messages and things that I I pulled into one document one google doc and tried to turn that into a bunch of songs basically or just kind of poems or just i I basically just put everything that i had written down into one place and tried to make sense of it and part of the reason i wanted to do that was because i couldn't sing my old songs i tried and it was once i had gone through that those series of events in my life i could not do the things that i'd been doing before it just felt like didn't feel hard for absolutely him. incompatible with yeah. who I am yeah. at that moment so and I tried and I I I had kind of like some hilarious mishaps trying to just sing my old songs it just really didn't work I heard a funny story that you were doing a gig and you made everyone do like a conga line yeah. and then you were like all right I this can't ha- I gotta yeah. this is it I I gotta do something else exactly something. I was opening for my friend Lola Kirk and I had a very short set and she said just come play some of your songs it'll be great and um, I really, I mean, like I had like a, my crisis took the form of a conga line and, and <laughs> yeah. yeah, it, it uh, I didn't want to do that to Craig every night on a tour. So <laughs> I, I was like, okay, I have the session with Josh. I'll use this time to write new songs. And I, right before the session, I got together with Craig and I said, Hey, do you want to go through this w- with your red pen for me? Like almost like going to a professor and, uh, and he said, yeah, sure. And I talked to a friend of mine about that and they were like, wow, that takes some guts to like go to someone that you really admire and have them like go through your unfinished, unedited, like thought process lyrics. And I was like, yeah, but also I I can't think of anything better. And, and he was so um, obliging and we just sat in this coffee shop and he would say like, oh, this is, this is a throwaway line. Like maybe this is not specific enough. Like maybe try to be more specific here. Like, Oh, I like this. This is a great title right here. You know, things like that. And just, just again, just getting more into his mind and seeing how it works and seeing, um, cause of course he's gone through all those editing processes mm. too with his work. Not we, we all do. Um, and so it felt really good to be vulnerable in that way. And, uh, and that was just a few days before going into the session with Josh. And so I went in with, a little bit more confidence in my lyrics which uh I hadn't really had before and and we would just go into the studio and every day I'd pull from the stack that I'd printed out and we'd be like okay let's work on this one and we'd start with uh an organ part or at one point um like for a song called hard drive I got there a little bit late that day and Josh said hey Eric Biondo has this um he's playing uh, on his Instagram, he, he always puts up a bunch of videos from his studio, uh, just what he's working on that day. He's like, Drummer. I really like this drum beat. Yeah, he yeah. plays in um, Antibalas. Yeah. And uh, he's like, I really like this drum beat. 
and he just, you know, put his audio jack into his phone, put it onto the computer, looped it, and that's how Hard Drive started. Mm. And so we were pulling from every everywhere and just kind of whatever we could pull off the walls. We were using that as a starting point, and then that starting point was all we needed to finish making the songs. And so I came in with the lyrics, and then Josh and I would make the music together. Um, By the way, we should talk about Hard Drive for a moment because yeah. the, the story of Hard Drive, it's like a security guard at the Met, your driving instructor, a bookkeeper in Topanga Canyon, a psychic, yeah. and all the connectivity yeah. between all of them. Yeah. So how do you take all those different characters yeah. and come up with the, the one connective tissue that runs through them to tie them together? Because when I first started you know, researching like the meanings behind some of the songs, yeah. I was like, it's really amazing that you were able to pull this all together and it makes sense, right? Yeah, I mean, I think that's the fun part. That's yeah. the puzzle. Yeah. And I think you can do that with anything. And maybe that's the part of me i i love uh reading tarot cards i can't say that i'm i'm good at it but the thing that i love about it is you pull them out and you you get four cards in front of you let's say and you find all the connections between all of them and you kind of create meaning from that mm. and you find the symbols and you see where they all line up and then then you talk to whoever you're talking to about how that relates to what they're going through in your life and you always find something to talk about yeah and they always have something to do with and then they'll say oh yeah you know i actually i did see this this rose on the street the other day and it's like the rose in the card and you you make those connections and it's it's pretty entertaining or at least for me it is so i i, I find the process of writing that song uh, the process of writing that song was very similar to to reading like someone's tarot cards it's yeah. just like okay i have these characters these are the things that they're saying to me and they relate somehow and that kind of you know when i felt myself sort of like laughing a little bit on the inside that's when it feels like oh that relates there, there's a connection there and of course the 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 main connection being the plan words of just the, the word drive i thought i was on the subway ride home and i i uh, i just remember kind of like laughing to myself and be like oh yeah hard drive it's a hard drive. Okay, <laughs> it's going to work. I'll put it together. And then I got to the studio the next day, and I was like, I think I have a refrain. It's not exactly a chorus, but I think it's going to work. And, uh, yeah, just kind of that sort of wayfinding one thing after the next. It's interesting because the song itself is over five minutes long. There's yeah. a saxophone. It's kind of spoken word. And it became, <laughs> you know, like I said, one of the – you're actually the most uh, – most popular song in the record and also ending up on also the list of yeah. all these, uh, all the press is really taken to that song so and your most unlikely. popular song, right? So unlikely. It's crazy. And it's yeah. fascinating because you used to write audio guides to things like yeah. museums and things like that. So I can see when I listen to the record where all that comes into play, it, it's really fascinating. Yeah. I uh, love audio guides. Yeah. I love them. <laughs> Um, so did you ever second guess yourself uh, as an artist after, you know, you're working with David Berman and he passed away and, and all that happened, as I, we talked about, you sold all your equipment, like take us up to the point where, you know, now at the point you're on all these lists, like we spoke mm -hmm. about, and things are at such a different place. Yeah. Isn't it incredible? Like how life works and the journey that yeah. you've come on? I think, yeah, I, I, the main thing that I'm taking away from it is just that, um, I have no idea how things are going to go. And the more you let go of of thinking that you have a plan, the, the better off things are. And, and you know, people have always said to me and, and in life, like, things can change on a dime. And I think about that all the time. And after I did, um, well, basically, but someone said that to me once after I did a, an audition with a band. I didn't end up getting the part. Um but what band was that, by the way? This was with the Dirty Projectors. Oh, cool. Okay. And my friend Maya ended up, Maya Friedman is uh, the guitarist in that band. Sure. And uh, in the new iteration of the band. Um, and who was the other person that was also going to maybe audition for Purple Mountains? Like, it's just, we're all kind of like, yeah, all in connected. The same. Yeah. Um, Connectivity, which is one of your themes that run through this record. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I kind of I feel it running. I think when I don't feel it, I get pretty freaked out. Yeah. Um, I'm always looking for it. I'm sort of dependent on it. Um, but just this idea, they, this person said to me, you know, like things can change on a dime. And I, I, I've always thought that to be like, you could lose anything at every, everything at any moment. Like you could get hit by a car, but like that kind of tragedy yeah. element of that statement. But 
when that person said that to me, I think they were saying like, yeah, good things can change on a dime too. Definitely. Like incredible things can happen <laughs> yeah. to you when you least expect it. And that really changed how I think about that phrase. And Well, I love the, the fact that you sold all your equipment and now this year was your biggest year ever. Right? Yeah, I mean, so. yeah, it's funny. I still haven't bought a guitar amp and I'm, I'm about to go on tour and I'm like, <laughs> man, that that amp that I only got 500 bucks for is now selling for 1700 bucks <laughs> in a guitar center. I'm like, ugh. But, but also, you know, sometimes that's what it takes is the total shedding of things to to find that that bedrock, you know, like when you hit your bottom, that's when you really find it. Um Definitely. And that was a bottom for me. And I'll I'll find another bottom at some point, um, and hope that it's as productive, but you can't plan on it. So But also sometimes in the face of adversity you had like a week to write the record, right? Yeah. Things happen if you I don't know if you watch the Beatles documentary that just came out, which I've was seen incredible. Parts, I haven't seen the whole thing yet, but yeah. You know, the Paul McCartney's like, let it be. Like he wrote the song in like eight minutes. And then, you know, know, these are like some of the greatest songs ever. Yeah. And I think their challenge was like, let's write a record in a week or two weeks and record it. Yeah. And essentially you wrote this record in a week and it yeah. turned out to be, you know, obviously you'll have more masterpieces to come. But yeah. at the moment, this is definitely well, one of the highlights. Yeah, for sure. So let's talk about touring because, I mean, how are you feeling with that? We were just talking a little bit like the COVID stuff. We walked yeah. in because everyone's, you know, it's 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 scary out there. Are you feeling okay going on tour coming up? I know you did some dates, right, recently? Yep, I did. Um, and there's a whole tour kicking off in like two weeks or something. Yep. I how do you so. how do you feel about it? What are you thinking? Um, I I have so many feelings about tour. I mean, I had to cancel some tours in the fall, and that was so painful. But it really helped me realize how badly I wanted to go on tour. Mm. Even though I think there's still parts of me that were really healing from this this crisis ongoing because it was sort of frozen when when COVID hit. I had already said like okay well I'm I was kind of done touring and and um didn't ever expect something like this to happen where I would have the opportunity to go on tours with my music and and tour with bands that I loved and uh I just didn't see that coming as a possibility so I I wasn't prepared for it um and uh I didn't I wasn't prepared to go into a situation where like I could really love touring again I think I had burnt out on it and then also um to have such a difficult experience I I think I I just needed a break I guess but I went on tour in Europe in the fall with some friends of mine and had so much fun and it was also really stressful, I got to say, like having to- a COVID on your tails and to be going. I was just talking to a friend about what it's like to go into a room full of people and most of them aren't wearing masks. And and you've just gone through like a Delta surge in New York and they haven't necessarily gone through it there yet. And you're just wanting to say, like, guys, just wear a mask. Yeah, really, totally. it, it really helps. And uh, and to feel like I can get on stage and confidently play a show, it's it's hard. It's yeah. it's very confusing, and I think we're seeing a lot of things get canceled right now. And I think we're going to get through this. We will. We will be gathering in public spaces again safely without this constant fear. Um, and I think we all just need to be really patient and compassionate with each other until then. Know that like things are going to get canceled. Things are going to plans are going to change. We all need to be really flexible. Um, and not get too crestfallen when they do fall through. Or um, so I think we might still see some some of that stuff happening. Um, but I'm patient. I know that I will get to go out there again. And during this one month in Europe, when I was on tour, we played in ten different countries. I think in about under thirty days. And to be in rooms full of people who knew the words to my songs uh, on the other end of the world was totally surreal um especially because i spent most of this year very isolated i spent a lot of it alone yeah, like everyone i think yeah um very very solitary time to then being in a room full of people and to be connecting on such a deep level with them i and and a lot of the people coming to my shows 
listen to my record during a very hard time in their life. And and so... By the way, it probably got them through this time period because that's what, it, you know, everyone looked for different things to help them get through yeah, this, too, whether it yes. be music, movies, yeah. TV, working out, whatever it may be. So I'm yeah. sure that this record got a lot of people through a lot of hard times. And now that it's been featured on Pitchfork, NPR, Spain, everywhere, it's everywhere, right? And on all these top 10 lists, even more people have been exposed to it. And I think it's a great thing. And so if all goes well, and I yeah. think it will, it uh, looks like February 12th, you'll be at the Troubadour uh, out yeah. here in LA, April 1st at yeah. Webster yeah. Hall. So I think you end up like, I think the tour ends up in like August 26th in London, it seems like, right? Yeah, I mean, the tour is, that's, it, that's probably the furthest state that I have booked out, but it's going to keep getting fleshed out too, I think. Um, yeah, I'm going on tour at the Weather Station with Andy Schaff. Um, doing a bunch of my own dates as well. Um, uh, Julia Jacqueline as well. Um, and yeah, I, I can't wait to keep playing shows. I, I know the shows that I did play in Europe, those were some experiences of performing that I've never had before. It, a lot of stuff is really unfolding for me as I'm moving forward. I'm in territory that I know nothing about. Yeah. Uh, and it's so exciting. And I, I, I've just never connected with people in this way before. Um, and I can't wait to be, I can't wait to be playing again and playing with my band. Um, and my band is constantly shifting a little bit, but I'm playing with a lot of my friends that I've been playing with for years. And, uh, I just, I just love, I just love being with them yeah, I don't know. Sure. i'm so excited did so. you work on new material given that all the time we had off here um well it's you know i have to say this year has been a really difficult year for writing uh for me and i think for uh, anyone who's having trouble with that like have compassion for yourself yeah. uh, we have a lot to process and it's not always going to come out in like a tidy little song um and but I I have just recently started writing again and it and it feels good and I'm I think it'll be different from this last thing that I made and I I hope maybe I'll work with Josh Kaufman again you know I I think I'm open to it taking whatever form it's going to take um and uh well I would say only take a week to make yeah, this next one because it worked for this one right <laughs> so yeah maybe that formula is something we should it, yeah can in. you trick the muse into <laughs> into working the same way twice i don't know yeah. we'll see well if you Stay haven't tuned. picked up an overview of phenomenal nature your second release critically acclaimed everywhere it's such a pleasure and i'm so happy you made it here Me i'm happy because you live in new york and we just happen to work this out with the yeah. timing which is great yeah. so topping every list including spin so we're all happy mm -hmm. daniel cohen thanks you i thank you for coming here and i hope to get to see you so maybe uh, maybe in L.A., maybe in New York, but either way, check. And, and we're looking forward to new music, too. So and the video, Haley, coming out, right? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, we have yet to shoot it, but yeah. keep your eyes peeled. Haley, uh, I love everything she does, as you know. Yeah. Um, so I think it's going to be a really fun video. Is that, by the way, is that your three-legged dog in the Michelangelo? Uh, that's actually the I found on Nextdoor.com, which is okay. a really funny website. <laughs> yeah. Um I put a listing up. I'm looking for three-legged dogs. Turns out someone on my block, a Had woman, a dog. has. She's she's also a singer, and we, <laughs> now we're friends. Now I see her all the time. Um, she had a three-legged dog named Skipper, and who kindly uh, was willing to star in my video. So apropos for your life. Yeah. Sandra yeah. Jenkins, thank you for coming in. I thank you, and we'll see you soon. Thanks for having me. Awesome.